my guest, Micah Hanks, his latest book is the UFO Singularity. Uh, he takes a very different approach to the study of strange aerial phenomena, looking specifically at how UFO reports may provide us with a glimpse at greater than human intelligence, as well as how different varieties of intelligence like this might come to originate here on Earth in the coming years. And he also takes an interesting look at how technology plays a role in what's called singularity. And that's not quite a term that too many people may be familiar with, or maybe you are familiar with that, but really that is the merging of human consciousness and technology. And uh, one of the things that I have been... <clears throat> avidly researching and writing about as well and sharing uh, information on is the fact that this technology has the capability of entering into the human body and basically turning the human body into, you know, either, a, you know, a computer, basically, a supercomputer. So um, he joins me tonight, and we're going to be talking about all of this, and we're going to be talking about the time issue. Uh, do UFOs or this kind of technology do they come from the present day? Is it something that's come from our future? I'm very excited to hear his thoughts on this and to ask him questions about his book. Um, so welcome. Thank you for being here, Michael. Thank you so much for taking time out to talk to me and my listeners tonight. Oh, Hillary, it's always my pleasure, always. <laughs> some of you might have remembered that I had him here a few years ago and we were talking about some of his uh, books that had come out at the time. Um, and that archive actually is still available in my archive page, so you can actually go down and download that. And all of my archives available for uh, MP3 downloads, so any format that you happen to have on you, it's available. So let's get right into it. So can you just give us a, a brief overview of how you got into writing this, uh, why this particular topic actually sparked such an interest that you made a whole book out of it? Of course. And, and, and very briefly, I'd just like to also reflect something that you've already touched on, Thoughts and prayers and good energy go out not only to those who have you know been dealing with the hardships uh, after the Boston Marathon bombing, but also what we learned about in Texas. My approach, Hillary, I'm sure is very similar to yours, and that is that we shouldn't focus on the negativity, but try and move forward and embrace positivity, so as to better be able to you know handle these kinds of things when they happen. Inevitably, we're going to you know be faced with change and also with challenge. Uh, that's just the nature of life, you know. And uh, we can either choose to be downtrodden about it, or we can pick ourselves up. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm human. I do the same thing. And I think that uh, you know it, it's better to focus on positivity. Uh, now, with my book, The UFO Singularity, that we're talking about tonight, really the message uh, is kind of the same. Uh, we as humans, we go through life, we face challenges, and it's all about how we choose to deal with those challenges that we are met with along the road of life. Many people are very resistant to change. In fact, I think every human is probably, to some extent, somewhat resistant to change fundamentally. Uh, you know, But I think that although we fear what we don't understand and things that are maybe outside our comfort zone, you could also argue that if there were no changes that occurred, we wouldn't have things like butterflies, you know. So I think that uh, it's important to remember that when we talk about such things as technological singularity, uh, while there is negative, there is also good. I try to take an approach that is, you know, that focuses on the potential good. In other words, you know, solving issues that people may have with, for instance, birth defects, you know, in the womb, everything from that to also later in life, the development of tumors and diseases and things along the lines of cancer. We will utilize technology eventually to be able to better our lives, but with that great power, of course, as they often say, comes great responsibility. And so, with the UFO singularity, I take this approach to the study of what you know many call the very controversial science of transhumanism and try and apply that to the study of UFOs just as well. And as you'd already mentioned in the very, very nice and probably too kind introduction that you gave me here, uh, there, uh, there are a lot of implications, I think, and parallels between the study of where we're going with our technology and what existent technologies may already be around us that we might refer to at times as being ufological in nature. You know, it's interesting because when I was preparing for this show, they had just announced recently within the last day or so that companies are attempting to pass legislation here in this uh, country to patent human genes specifically. The, the one thing, and we'll get into some of the questions regarding your book specifically, but one of the things I'd like to ask your thoughts on is since you take this positive approach in trying to transmute, you know, what may be perceived as kind of a scary thing or change for people, um, it, it, it's a matter of trust, I believe. Most people just don't trust 
the mega corporations, the military industrial complex. I mean, we haven't had much to really gain that trust with these mega powers that really oversee the fundamental development of these technologies. And where's our vote in how we want these technologies to move forward? I mean, I mean, the average person who is not necessarily connected to the actual development or the carrying forward of these technologies out into the world, uh, we don't have a vote. We don't have a say. If we don't want it, we just, we're just kind of here along for the ride. How do you address that kind of questioning to the majority of people who feel that way, who are very weary and distrustful of the companies developing this kind of technology? Well, first, Hillary, I have to say that I share that sentiment. Uh, you know, I am someone who is, uh, you know, hopeful, and I always try and take a positive outlook on life. I think that there will be innumerable benefits on down the road once we harness technologies that can cure diseases and, of course, can also improve maybe not only the quality of life, but also things such as the longevity of life. But by the same token, when we have companies that are essentially in control of how that is done, you know, unfortunately, it's always the case that there's going to be a business interest, and therefore only the things that can be profited from directly are going to be innovated. Now, many would argue that there are already cures, uh, if not cures, much more uh, suitable treatments for things like cancer that are available to us today, and they simply aren't sought out and, and mass-produced because they aren't profitable enough. In other words, when you have something that is so uh, easily obtained, even if it's an effective treatment for a disease, for instance, it's not going to be something that's going to be, uh, you know, uh, put into widespread use if it can't be profited from. And that is absolutely shameful. So, you know, I don't mean to come across as sounding like I'm ignorant to the potential downfalls that we stand to, uh, I, I guess, as opposed to gain from, lose from in terms of transhuman, uh, transhumanism and, and moving forward into what we would call singularity kind of studies. I'm not also, in addition to trying not to be a naive individual, I also am not someone who is an overt advocate for what we call transhumanism. As a journalist with, with relation to studying UFOs, something I've been passionate about and very interested in for a long time, again, I see some pretty distinct parallels. But I have to say that, you know, in, in answer or, or in response to your present question, I do share those same sort of sentiments that, you know, I think it's natural for people to be tr distrustful of large corporations that seek to control and steer innovation for purposes of monetary gain. And it's unfortunately, again, one of those aspects of reality that we just have to deal with. Uh, you know, if you're going to have agencies like the FDA that are going to make, uh, you know, certain that certain treatments aren't going to be available. And otherwise, um, I, I guess you might take, for, uh, for instance, uh, if they're going to be working with large pharma companies and things along these lines to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, particular varieties of these uh, uh, treatments and drugs and, and the like are going to be available as opposed to maybe less expensive generic brands and things as history has shown. There's always going to be a problem, I think, inherent to that. When we move forward into new kinds of technological innovations and treatments and things that may be under the umbrella of what we call transhumanism, sure, we'll face those same sort of problems because I know we face them today. Mm, that's a good point. And one of the other things that crosses my mind when I think about this topic is class separation. I mean, <clears throat> because these companies will be working to provide it on a profit basis, just because that is the structure that exists at the moment, you know, will only certain people be allowed to afford these kind of enhancements to their biological form? Well, the others just simply don't, and they continue on their life as is. You know, are we really looking at creating two different specific species among the human genome? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's that's a heavy question right there. And many have argued that if there is, you know, I don't think that uh, you, you'd use the term allowed, and I know exactly what you mean by that. But but to clarify, even without there having to be, uh, you know, restricted access only to certain individuals, at at the outset, any kind of new uh, technology. Uh, is going to be a little bit more costly. You know, think about video game systems. You know, every couple of years there's a new and updated and expanded and improved variety of a game system. But, you know, the equivalent that we would have paid a few hundred dollars for back in 1989 versus what we have right now, you know, the the old standard platform, eight, the NES Nintendo system, it's not exactly state-of-the-art anymore, and you can play those <laughs> kinds of games for free if you have an Internet connection. You can get laptop computers, which used to cost several hundreds of dollars. You can buy a brand-new, fairly decent laptop computer, uh, you know, in most stores and especially online for just a couple of hundred dollars now. The point I'm making is that 
at the outset, a new technology is always going to be more expensive. And even if it's not a restricted access sort of situation, we're, we could assume that only the most wealthy among us will be able to have access by yeah. virtue being able to pay for something. And so one question, I think, as a byproduct of that, that many have come to, the, to, to me and said, you know, what do you think about this, as you just have, is will there ever be a point where transhumanism will lead to a actual noticeable distinction between what we know as humans of today and perhaps an enhanced variety of human of tomorrow. You know, what's something that a, a colleague of mine has referred to as homo mechanicus. But I also think that when we utilize technologies that are so advanced but also capable of changing on a fundamental, perhaps even a microscopic or a quantum level what humans are, we often have these ideas from television that we're going to be, you know, robots walking around. I don't know that that's necessarily the case, Hillary. I think that, if anything, we will eventually begin to utilize technology so advanced that it will mimic what we would call organic. You may not be able to see differences between us and them in terms of whether or not they are fully organic or if they appear to be partially cyborg or something like a science fiction movie, but that doesn't remove the possibility that other fundamental physical changes could occur. Whether or not it will lead to there being humans and something else in our midst and that there will be an all-new kind of class warfare, it almost becomes kind of a political question, but it's a viable one. And at, this, at the present date, despite some of the technological trends that we can observe that kind of give us at least a glimmer of a hope of an idea of what we're looking at for maybe the next two, three decades, as I've outlined in my book, The UFO Singularity, I still don't think that right now with all the potentials, uh, both good and bad, that lapse between the present day and maybe 30 years from now, with all the things that could happen between now and then, we really aren't armed with enough data in terms of understanding what those kinds of beings, if you don't call them humans, would be like, or what kind of a world we would live in if transhumanism leads to a point where, at, at least for a, a brief period in chronological human history, we are on Earth and we're sharing the planet with another kind of intelligence. But think about this for just a moment. Uh, in the in the manner in which I'm phrasing this, I'm talking about humans existing alongside a potentially more advanced intelligence, some physical presence, maybe even something that at one time was human. Again, I think that this is an incredible parallel to what we already are faced with in terms of ufology and the study of UFOs because we appear to be dealing with an intelligence that exceeds natural levels of human intelligence. They seem to have technological abilities that exceed what we have. If we were to look at this from an extraterrestrial perspective, obviously they would not be our descendants or something that had at one time been, been human. But, you know, in popular UFO cases such as the uh, the Rendlesham incident and a few others and many other theorists out there, aside from myself, uh, you know, have put forth the idea that perhaps some aspects of the UFO phenomenon, as we perceive it, could emanate from our future. It could actually be an interaction of present-day humans with maybe what will eventually become our post-biological descendants. So, again, there are so many ways that you can tie this together, and I don't mean to be entirely speculative about it, but I think that, as you, we've pointed out already, Technology is going to do what it's going to do. Those who can afford it at the time are going to be able to have first access to it. At some point, there is going to be a disparity created. It may be a humans versus something else scenario, and I argue we're already looking at something very similar to that right now, as we have been for the last several decades, in terms of the UFO-human interaction. I agree 100%. I think that's a well-stated. Uh, I remember having a conversation with Phil Corso, Jr., off the record, about this very topic, and uh, this was probably back around 2009, 2010. So it was a few years ago, and, and since then we've had so many of these announcements saying that we have these new discoveries and technologies coming out. And one of the things that I will never forget that he said to me, that in fact I wrote it down, was that we were headed towards conscious technology, that the ships that the US, you know the ETs the, the, the intelligent extraterrestrials that are coming to the planet that are getting here uh, are actually part of their ships that they're actually they they actually merge with their ships like there's a conscious uh, technology that allows them to be able to to fly them and to connect with them so that was always something that I had put in the back of my mind and said that's really interesting and then as all of these Announcements came through and, and uh, articles were written and, and released. It was it was rather pivotal to me to just be able to 
connect those dots there and to watch that happen. So I feel what's happening very strongly, not only with my own research and, and talking to, to people like yourself and, and, uh, you know, just being in, in the loop or trying to be in the loop anyway uh, about what's going on is really that this is happening whether we want it to or not. And it's, it's something that we are evolving towards. So there's been lots of times when I sit there and wonder, well, are these really us coming back to, to do whatever work we're supposed to be doing, which leads us into the, the topic of time travel. So how do you see time travel in, in perspective to the UFO phenomena? Well, you know, there are a number of ways that I think that uh, time travel could come into question here. Uh, speaking with a colleague of mine, Rich Dolan, recently, uh, we, we were we were kind of looking at the way that, uh, I, I guess, the, the, the general conception of time travel is like what we see in the films, you know, H.G. Wells or Marty McFly and Doc Brown, you know, literally uh, building some sort of a machine that can travel backward, forward, you know, any which way throughout space-time. We can travel to different chronological points in our own history or perhaps our own temporal future. Now, I think that uh, I'd like to step back away from, first of all, the idea of a machine capable of doing that and just say that time being the illusion that it is, you know, the chronological progression of what we call time is really kind of a term that we use for an element and probably a very limited element uh, relative to human perception. We could assume that maybe the chronological passage of time as observed by humans is actually something that we evolved for whatever reason to be able to do. And that perhaps on another planet, you know, or in another state of being, another dimensional state, if you will, uh, that there could be intelligent life that has evolved in vastly different ways than we are uh, or that we have, and that they may utilize different perceptual or sensory abilities that allow them to see beyond the typical uh, chronological limitations of time as humans perceive it. I've read philosophical articles that really kind of have begun to uh, elucidate to me why that may be a, a, not only a possibility, but maybe a plausible theory in a way that we can begin to look at UFO phenomena a little differently at the outset with even out, without even having to have what we would call time machines. You know, and simple examples of this would be, of course, you know, the study of such things as time dilation, which was, of course, you know, an, an actual testable and observable phenomenon as predicted by Albert Einstein with his relativity theory. Uh, so we know that time uh, aspects of time can be different or can change relative to such things as the exertion of a gravitational field on an object or the speed through which uh, the object is passing through space, et cetera, et cetera. There are many other things that we could use to illustrate that. And I would encourage people just to get online and read about time dilation to better understand that as opposed to really spending 20 minutes talking about it right now. I do get into it a good bit in the book. But we also talk about it from a philosophical perspective the notion that, you know, when you or I are looking ahead, I can look across the field and I can see if I'm walking to the other side of that field. In a sense, I can actually see my future. That is actually me looking across physical space. It's not really my future, but again, in philosophical terms, it gives us kind of a reference point by which we can observe that I can literally look into my future, but I don't know what actual events may take place there. Funny enough, we can look into our memory and we can remember or quote unquote see through memories what has occurred in the past. We can remember the past and we can experience the, the present, but we have a limited ability to understand what's going on in the future despite what time dilation tells us about the nature of space and time, which implies, Hillary, I think that the future actually exists, but again, relative to our ability to perceive it, humans are incapable of interacting directly with that existent future. We're waiting for it to get here but all the time we are right here. And every time I say I'm right here, that was just a second ago, wasn't it? So, <laughs> you know, so when we look at all these funny little quirks about space and time, I, I begin to think that if indeed there is something about human perception that ever is capable of changing or being modified in, with purpose, we might be able to look at and perceive space and time a little differently. Now, uh, to be brief, here's how I think that might happen. In his book, A Brief History of Time, Stephen Hawking talked about what he called the thermodynamic arrow of time. Um, you'd mentioned earlier in the program that eventually with you, the utilization of, of advanced technology, humans will essentially become computers. I would argue really that we're already computers. And when we design a computer, a device that is capable of doing, you know, advanced computation, uh, you know, on a scale that is perhaps more advanced than a human, but not on a conscious level like humans are capable of doing, 
We often think that computers are smarter than we are in some ways already, but they're also inherently more limited than we are. Nonetheless, I think computers, much like in the Judeo-Christian tradition, God made Adam in his image. We do the same thing, whether or not by purpose or just mere, merely by chance. We have made computers in our image, and we are constantly working toward making computers more and more like us to the point that eventually we will be dealing with artificial intelligence. Now, when we talk about how computation actually works, getting back to the idea of thermodynamic principles as outlined by not just Stephen Hawking, but many others have talked about this, it all comes down to something that we call entropy, basically the order uh, or the, rather the creation of disorder in the universe. All things, all states of matter tend to trend toward disorder. A simple example, you can hold a raw egg in your hand in its shell, you drop that on the floor, and all of a sudden that egg is splattered all over the place. It's very difficult to take that egg once the shell is broken and it, the yolk is splattered all over the floor and everything. It's very difficult to take that egg, reassemble it, and put it back together. And that's a simple example of how matter trends toward disorder and chaos. We get older. We don't tend to reverse aging despite all the supplements and all different kinds of things out there that claim to be able to do so. Now, one day, however, we may be able to challenge the laws of entropy if we utilize advanced technologies that can reach what I guess Schrodinger and others called negentropy or reverse entropy. If we can reverse the natural flow of thermodynamics okay, in our universe, what kinds of repercussions would this have on beings? Will humans live forever? I think that that's a simple interpretation, but there may be other things that would happen just as well. Now, coming back to the function of, of a computer for just a moment. If a computer is capable of storing information, but despite the order that is created in, in the universe through the creation of or the storage of data, the heat that is expended, I'm sure everyone's laptop, if they're sitting on their, on their laps, they're going to feel the warmth coming off of that computer. Computers capable of storing and, and, and ordering information nonetheless expend a lot of heat, and so the, the measure of entropy created is actually greater than the order that is created in the universe. Hawking and others have argued that the human mind works in very much the same way, that we could sit down, we could memorize an entire book, but despite the order that we manage to create in our universe by doing so, we have to be able to feed ourselves. We have to be able to sleep. And so the energy expended in doing so is still greater than the order created. And all these things still confirm, or conform to thermodynamic laws. But if we get to a point where, and this is where I think it, it, it gets important to look at some of the existing technologies today, and more importantly those of the future, that the transhumanists or the singularitarians, if you want to call it, are always jumping up and down about. Once we utilize things such as microscopic or even nanocomputational components, tiny little bits and pieces of nanotechnology, they could constitute miniature computers of the future. Once we have little tiny objects that are capable of such computation, uh, arguably something so small would actually expend less heat. And one theory is that it, with, with computational components that are so small that they would expend little or no heat, that might be one of the first ways that we would literally be capable of reversing or at least negating entropy. If we can do that and we utilize advanced nanotechnologies of the future, to build our computers and to make them far more efficient than what we have right now, or taking that one step further, if we utilize that kind of nanotechnology to literally enhance the performance of the human brain, will we get to a point where we actually lessen the effects of entropy on both computation and our human physicality? And then, Hillary, what will that do for our perception of space and time? As Hawking had said, there's a thermodynamic arrow of time. We have to perceive space and time as humans, being these computational beings that we are, in the very same direction that entropy increases. And thus, if we actually are capable of removing or modifying the direction and the flow of time through entropy, does human perception change just as well if we become more efficient in that capacity as well? Now, I couldn't tell you because we haven't reached that point yet, but I think that there's a very strong possibility that once we begin to employ such things as nanotechnology and what we would call singularity sciences, in the future they will begin to change fundamentally the way that humans perceive the world around us and what we call reality. That, my friend, may be the very first inkling that we will get of you know, how time travel will actually occur. And it wouldn't necessarily have to involve a machine, I don't think. It could be on a perceptual level. Mm, interesting that you say that because the Apache elders that I work with have said that we are in now the fifth world. And in the fifth world, humans become the technology of the future. That is the prophecy that they build their belief systems off of. So it's interesting that you have basically just said the same thing. Now, 
What about the impact on the environment? A lot of the talking has been about humans and the body and perception and the brain. We really don't know the environmental impact of introducing the nano scale anything, you know, into this environment. So do you worry about that? Do you think about that? Have you, have you kind of put that into your theory about how this, uh, the singularity works as far as this goes? I mean, we're putting nanoparticles into plastics or to, you know, into different materials that we use to make them stronger or, you know, um, and so what about breaking down into the environment, uh, putting those particles into the environment? I mean, uh, how, where are we going to go with that? Well, you know, I don't address those things directly in the UFO singularity, but nonetheless, I'm glad you asked about that because that's something I think about quite often. On my, on my podcast that I do each week, the Graylian Report, uh, we spent a, a, a lot of time uh, back, uh, I guess it was, uh, if not last week, I guess two weeks ago, talking about, uh, I think, what's officially called the Farmer Assurance Provision, but many are calling it the Monsanto Act. I'm sure you've heard about this. Yes. Um, you we're talking about, you know, genetically modified foods and things like this and essentially legislating provisions that will protect companies who are doing this sort of thing, even if years on down the road it's found that you, the introduction of genetically modified foods and other things into our, not only our culture and into our surroundings, but into our bodies since we're eating vegetables produced uh, by these plants. If this actually ends up being harmful on down the road, uh, there have been provisions tucked neatly away and hidden, if you will, into a, in a, 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 a I guess it was an economic spending bill, uh, and it was passed into law so that these companies won't, uh, you know, wreak the havoc of those who, well, would claim injury or 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 other kind of suffering on down the road. In other words, what we're doing is we're changing things about the world, the world around us, the food that we eat, the way it is grown. We don't know or understand fully all of the potential implications, and people are basically trying to cover their hind ends before we get to a point on down the road where maybe we realized, wow, we should have thought this through before we got into that. Now, when it comes to nanotechnology, you know, I don't know what kinds or what forms of nanotechnology will be instituted in the future and whether those would be good or bad in terms of, you know, produce or livestock or anything like that. Or whether nanotechnology would even be the, the the best example of how we will begin to change things in the world around us. I think maybe one thing that we could look at, um, as opposed to nanotechnology, is coming back around to what Monsanto is already doing, genetically engineering different kinds of food crops and things. Think about what else we're doing in laboratories. I've called it slightly tongue in cheek, uh, petri meat, but uh, you know, literally, we are capable of producing. Um, meat or what we would call, I guess, meat-like substance that was never a part of a living creature, but nonetheless is produced and which, if not already, you know, at present, it will be very soon something that can be produced and will be edible. Uh, you know, food that can be produced in a laboratory, that's good, but by the same token, again, we're still dealing with genetically engineered food stuff. Um, we don't know all the implications and especially what the long-term either benefits or perhaps maybe some of the long-term consequences. I think a lot of people look more in terms of the consequences of consuming these sorts of things, but we don't know what the long-term results, good or bad, will be when we institute mm. these sorts of things. And so, I mean, and I think a lot of people would say, you're crazy, Micah Hanks, just shut up, because really we're dealing with scarcity already in the world. We need to be able to feed everybody, and right now this is going to be a fix to the problem, so quit complaining. Well, I don't dispute that, but by the same token, we just better be careful in the way that we go about trying to solve scarcity issues right now, which is really yeah. fundamentally what all economics is about. Is it going to be for good or for bad in the long run? That's the question yeah. I'm asking. Well, you know, I, I agree with that, and I, and I do have to say, though, that the problem, as I see it, is that you have a lot of countries on this planet who have completely banned it or at least agreed to label if it is in the food. So what Obama has just done recently over the last few weeks is allow legislation to go through the government and pass that we in the United States are not necessarily allowed or, or even given, you know, it's not labeled. The companies don't have to label it, and GMOs can go in whatever they want, and we don't have to know about it as consumers. So, again, going back to what I had asked you at the beginning of the of this show is it, it's very obvious why consumers, why the masses, why people are a little hesitant to, you know, just jump on board with let's look at the positivity of all this because of, of what they see see actively happening from the people who are supposed to be in charge, looking out for their best 
best interest, creating uh, committees and government uh, organizations and agencies to, to protect and serve that aren't protecting and serving, that aren't listening to the people. There was a petition sent to the White House that had almost, I believe, 300,000 plus signatures on it. I could be wrong about that, but it was close. And it was completely ignored, and the legislation went through. And now what's happening is Monsanto is going state to state to take away farmers' rights of being able to really, you know, uh, oversee their operations in that sense as well. So we have a, a corporate, mega-corporate kind of takeover that's happening where people just really are not allowed to to have a say or, a, you know, any kind. And when I say allowed, I mean literally not allowed. I mean, there really isn't anything they can do about it. You, you know, they follow the roots of trying to do it the way, you know, democracy has set up for us to be able to do, and it just simply isn't working. Whoever goes into these presidential leadership roles or or likewise, you know, it, is really – has all their hands and pockets tied into these mega corporations that pay them well, you know, their stocks do well. And, and also another thing that was passed this week, Obama has signed the fact that they no longer have to disclose, you know, their taxes or where their money's going or, or how their stock investments are coming back. Uh, it basically dissolves insider trading regulation that was put in there to protect people. I mean, it just feels very negative and in, 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 in trying to be positive about it, I think we also have to be realistic about what's happening and we have to know when enough is enough and we have to say, hey guys, this is great, um, but cancer curing, I don't think necessarily is the goal because cancer curing wipes out a multi-billion dollar business that employs uh, mega corporations also. You have this huge entity set up to assist in the cancer um, process, the diagnosing process, the, the, um, you know, the, the, the healing process, all of that. But curing is a whole nother issue. There have been technologies that have come out that have shown and, and proven such as, um, you know, we have different technologies, Tesla technology. We have Rudolph, um, um, the Rife machine that's come out that has shown uh, to be effective on cancer cells and so on and so forth. And these things are really shut down as fast as they come out. Um, so it, it's it's an interesting history, I think, to look back. And, and when you take in all of the information and you look at it and you discern through it and you sort through it and you kind of just use common sense, it, it tells me that, well, you know what? If nobody's listening to me now, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm just playing, you know, devil's advocate here, Micah. Sure. So I'm just kind of saying to myself, you know, as a, as a parent, as a community member, as a woman, you know, who who's responsible for a house household, you know, I don't want my children exposed to things that I don't trust. I don't want them having things put into their food or into their bodies that that I don't 100 percent know much uh, what the consequences are going to be. I think there comes a point where we have to address these kind of technologies on a planetary basis, not just a country basis or a corporation basis. Um, where it's, it's, we have to take the whole picture in. We have to take a look at, it's not just environmental impact to my state or my city or my country. It's the environmental impact to the world. And, you know, supposedly on the surface anyway, the governments can't get along for anything and nobody's really, you know, moving in the direction of helping the third world countries who, you know, are they going to have access to this kind of technology? I mean, they can barely provide their, their citizens with water and, and food as it is so there's a lot of a lot of i think there's a chasm almost that we have to really cross in order to have integrity with this kind of of uh, technology and we have to think about the generations to come because if we don't we're, in, we're we could potentially make a lot of damage and a lot of headache for for our children and our grandchildren and the generations that come behind us that will eventually take over taking care of this planet and say what the heck did our ancestors do oh my gosh look what they've done so when I when I read your book, your book is fantastic. I love the questions that you bring up, the points that you make, the information that you share. I think it's wonderful. But I, I think that in in this whole transhumanism singularity issue, it's it's a very delicate, touchy subject with and for a lot of reasons. Um, now, when it comes to UFOs, I mean, 
there are people who don't even believe UFOs are real. So how, when you come across people that say, well, UFOs aren't real, you know, show me the, show me the proof, show me the metal, show me the craft. When I see an actual landing in my backyard, that's when I'll believe. How do you, how do you talk to those people? Have you, I'm sure you've come across those people who say that to you. How do you deal with that kind of skepticism that says, well, you're already kind of, I, I'm not even listening to you anymore because once you bring in the UFO word, I, I just totally just dismiss you because I have absolutely refused to acknowledge the fact that they exist. How do you overcome that? Well, Hillary, that's one of the the number one reasons why I I really have taken more of a philosophical approach to the study of UFOs uh, in recent years. Uh, I had something of an epiphany well, maybe two years ago, I was I was house sitting for a friend, and uh, you know he had a beautiful uh, you know, backyard, of course, with all the trees kind of uh, you know growing down the side of a bank, so that you could see right over their tops and out into the wide open sky. And being a fellow stargazer like I am, he had a high powered telescope there in in his living room that would stare out directly into this beautiful starscape overlooking what's known as the, as the Swannanoa Valley. Uh, here in uh, outside of Asheville, North Carolina, where I live, and uh, so I spent about a week up there. Uh, stargazing using that telescope and, and I, and I, you know, I like going to high places or maybe what spiritualists would call thin places, trying to unwind, turn off the radios, turn off the music, turn off the television. I don't, I don't even own a television in my home. I, I get my news primarily from the web because I found that in that profound silence, that's where you find the answers. And so I began speaking, uh, or, uh, uh rather seeking answers in the silence, uh, while enjoying a good bit of, uh, you know, stargazing. Uh, a couple of years ago during this instance, and I kind of came to this epiphany that really, if we're going to understand UFOs, I don't think I understood what this meant at the time, but I realized that there was a, ne- a necessity for taking an epistemological approach. You know, in other words, taking a philosophical approach that examined the science or the study of what we know and what we are able to know. At that point, I began to take what I call a more skeptical approach myself. But, you know, again, I have to be very careful in calling myself a skeptic because by the modern definition of that term, I'm certainly not what modern skeptics identify with, you know, each other by calling themselves and and their organizations a skeptic. You know, by today's standards, very sadly, as a person who apparently goes about uh, the study of anything unknown or, un, you know, unexplained, uh, you know, like a UFO or cryptozoology or a ghost or anything like that, and they, they enter with a predisposition toward disbelief rather than an open-minded approach that says, let's see where the facts take us. And so the skeptic, I find, systematically denies information. And so when I'm approached by people like that, uh, I first often will tell them, listen, you can call me crazy. I've had many people say, honey, you're nuts. What are you talking about, aliens? And I said, first thing I point out to them is when we talk about UFOs, we don't have to be talking about aliens. And I personally have never seen evidence that Earth is being visited by extraterrestrials. Well, maybe there's some evidence, but I certainly haven't seen proof. But the evidence that we do have is only one interpretation of the data. We, again, without proof of extraterrestrial visitation, we only have some really good evidence. But, again, if there were proof, people like Dr. Greer wouldn't be making films that were, you know, seeking to try and find answers. We wouldn't be signing petitions and trying to get the White House to release information about extraterrestrials. We seem to know in our hearts that something else is going on, but we're still looking for the absolute valid, here it is right in front of your face, proof. And so when I encounter people who are of a, quote-unquote, modern skeptical ilk, I often tell them, listen, I'm skeptical, too. And it's not necessarily a dirty word. You don't have to be a bad person or a disbeliever to be a skeptic. But what you do have to do is you have to look at what the facts dictate. And here are what the facts, based on what my, you know, <laughs> logical inquiry into the study of UFOs uh, have helped me to determine at present. And I'm sure there'll be many more determinations to follow. But at, at present, I I feel that there is plenty of evidence that there is something going on. Whatever this is, is an advanced technology. These Technologies have been in our midst at least uh, in, in in the modern uh, world for the last maybe you know six or seven decades. Uh, you know, especially they became prevalent right after the Second World War. Perhaps the majority of them can be explained by natural phenomenon, as was discussed in the I believe the May issue. This was, was the current issue on the newsstands of Astronomy Magazine. But by the same token, it is willful denial to say that all strange phenomenon that has been called ufological in nature over the last several decades can be explained by light reflecting off the bellies of ducks or geese in flight. (laughs) 
planet Venus. But no, I kid you not. You know, Philip Plate <laughs> actually wrote an article in Astronomy Magazine, the current issue. Folks, go out and buy it. You can get it for six ninety nine or five ninety nine, I guess, on the newsstand. I did. I wanted to see what they had to say. And, of course, they take five well-known UFO instances. The Phoenix Lights case, you know, uh, they take a, a few others. I think the spiral thing that showed up in Norway a few years ago. A lot of these things were already well-known as having not been "Quote unquote unknowns." Okay, they were identified mm-hmm. flying objects, and yet they used them for purposes of promoting a debunker agenda, as though to say all UFO cases can be explained. What they failed to do is address the true anomalies that exist in the record. And as Stanton Friedman wrote in the rebuttal to Philip Plate uh, and the article that appeared in Astronomy, around 27 percent, which was what was determined by uh, Blue, uh, Project Blue Book special, pro- uh, what was the special uh, document? I can't remember the names and the documents and all this, but one of the final determinations that the Project Blue Book had undertaken with regard to the percentage of UFO sightings that actually remained unidentified. It was a small percentage, but, you know, between around 25 and 30 percent were still classified as unknown. That's a pretty large number. And so when people say, well, okay, you're crazy because you're talking about aliens, I say, no, 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 I'm talking about (laughs) UFOs. There is a distinction, and if you look at the history of the study of ufological matters, if you look at the government documents that have already been released through the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, and other websites and organizations, and not just in the U.S., but around the world, there's plenty of evidence of something. We just don't have proof that is irrefutable in terms of what exactly that something is. And that's what I tell people. And anyone who tries to say that there's nothing to the study of UFOs, they're not a skeptic, they're a denialist. Mm, Excellent point. Very well said. I agree 100%. You you hit it right on the head. Uh, You've obviously dealt with that question a lot. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Considering, you know. (laughs) Well, you know, I mean, you know, again, if you if you pull it back a little bit to the to the average person who doesn't deal with this topic on a regular basis. And, you know, you bring them to an observatory and you sit them down for a presentation on the universe and they see the trillion car, you know, stars that are in the, in the universe and you just, you just have to be extremely closed down to think that we are the only planet on the tiny little star in the middle of a trillion. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. It, it just it's not a rational thought. It's, you know, it, it really is a denial, a state of denial, and, it, and it's about protecting comfort zones. And do you feel that what's happening on the world stage right now with with some of the things that are going on, that this this attempt to... Well, I don't know if it's necessarily an attempt, but it just feels like it's a, it's a choice if you choose to tune into it in a fearful state. Have you noticed a difference personally? Have you had your own experiences where fear disconnects you from the connection that you have with the the consciousness level of of, of star beings or ETs or whatever you want to call them? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I um I, I am a person who. Uh, <laughs> I, I try not to be a, a, a walking contrarian or a walking contradiction, you know, but I'm someone who really tries to look at, again, facts and data, uh, and therefore scientifically, and I will state that uh, with with absolute uh, uh, sincerity and also resolution, uh, that from a scientific standpoint, I have no evidence that, uh, you, you know, humans are interacting with extraterrestrials or other beings, you know, other intelligences. Uh, there is clearly something going on. Um, the evidence shows that there is something going on, but again, I don't have proof that these are aliens or that they're interdimensional beings or that they are gods or that there are other things like that. Now, let's change gears here because I think, uh, you know, like you can take a computer and on different partitions you can run separate operating systems. I've got an operating system that looks hyperlogically and scientifically at reality, and then there's one that takes a spiritual look at reality just as well. Uh, while the other quote-unquote pseudo-skeptics out there roll their eyes, I think that really it's important to be able to pair yourself against yourself and, and pair your ideas and your ideology against itself at times so that you can better perhaps take an objective stance and not get so riddled with just one set of ideas, values, or principles. So looking at the other partition, the other operating system here, um, I'm spiritual just as well, and there is a part of me that feels that I experience synchronicities and that I'm you know, given if not actual direct messages, you know, which uh, you say that nowadays and they're going to try and put you on medication. Uh, you know, I definitely feel that I'm steered in a certain direction. I do feel that I've had at times premonitions and that, yes, there's a higher level of consciousness that through things such as meditation and focused, uh, you know, transcendental meditation and, and uh, you know, I think really just kind of living a, a singular and focused and, 
and, and, and, and um, I don't know how you'd term it, but, you know, just, a, I guess, a holistic life, I, mean, I think that you can raise yourself into that level, whatever that is, onto that plane of awareness. And I think that you can expand your horizons and that at times there are, for lack of a better term, maybe interactions with something that do occur. Young might have called this the collective unconscious. They may have been archetypes. Some would call them Anakian angels or maybe just angels outright. Some would say that these are, you know, divine beings or that we're actually accessing the Akashic record. Who knows, Hillary, what's actually going on? But I have that side just as well, and I have a sincere hope to be able to connect with the universe and with nature and with reality in that capacity just as well. Um, with what's going on in the world, there's a bit of, I guess, what we might call psychic dissonance or something like that that's going on. Um, I mean, we are seeing things um, just about as bad as they were, uh, maybe not quite as dire as just uh, immediately prior to the Second World War. Uh, but then again, whereas there was a little pressure cookie, a cooker, uh, that was about to erupt in Europe during the Second World War. Right now, we've got maybe just as much trouble going on on a worldwide scale. It's more spread out. The problems may not be necessarily one organization or one ideology against the world or with purpose of trying to go out there and cause you know trouble or wreak havoc, but there's definitely something going on. You can feel it. We see it every day. When, when there are people who are literally feeling, <laughs> I, I, I guess that's a poor choice of words to say pressure cooker because this is exactly what they did in, in Boston. When you have people that have enough evil in their hearts that they think that that is, for whatever reason, a way to make a political statement. I'm sorry, we don't have all the facts, but it does appear at least that uh, the uh, planning of that attack in the town of Boston, okay, on tax day, probably was some variety of political statement. There is a sad state of affairs in America when we have citizens or anyone else who thinks that that is a, a viable way of political expression, hurting other people, but that's never the answer. So is there something going on that is affecting us and that, like I said, causes a bit of psychic dissonance and that is troubling to people? Absolutely. And how do I combat that? I often use a term called cosmic love, you know, kind of, a, I guess I would call it a, an enlightened state of awareness that you can have not only with other people, you know, just through talking and through trying to reach out and try and express a little compassion and share with others, exchange ideas, you know, but also reach out to the world and try and put yourself in other people's shoes and understand what it's like to live elsewhere, to be elsewhere in the world. These sorts of things, I think, enrich our existence. And if more people did that, maybe we would have less, in less instances of violence and aggression like we see right now. But there's so much of it that, yeah, it is definitely a problem. And I don't know exactly how we should deal with that. You know, I think each individual has to figure that out for themselves, but I don't ever think that the answer is to do so violently. Mm, I agree. Humans becoming humane, evolving into that. You touched on something interesting as well um, when you were talking about, you know, this ability to go into your more intuitive side and, you know, the fact that we have two halves of the brain that really operate on two different pretty solid uh, levels of understanding, you know, uh, there is a lot of men who work on a linear side, a lot of women who work on the intuitive side. And when we merge that, when we begin to merge that, we do begin to reach uh, a different level of consciousness. Do you suppose that it is possible to become transhuman without technology? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Transhuman is a concept. You know, we use that term to express a concept. Most people assume that we're going to utilize transhuman technologies, in other words, actual physical nuts and bolts technologies, to achieve such things as brain-computer interfaces. And with the utilization of brain-computer interfaces, we will be able to functionally enable what we might call telepathy or extrasensory perception. This is literally something that for military purposes, people are already working with this. But before that kind of technology has existed, and we're already right now just on the very cusp of being able to utilize technologies that might enable this, what were people doing back in the 1970s in government agencies? What were taxpayer dollars being spent on? Think about the Stargate project. You know, they were trying to train guys like Ingo Swan and other professional psychics to be remote viewers for purposes of espionage. So yeah, one idea is that technology might get us there, but I think that there are other ways that humans can deepen not only their understanding of the universe, but perhaps their actual physical abilities. And again, I think that, you know, a skeptic is going to say, a modern skeptic is going to say that is absolute hogwash. People don't have psychic abilities. I'd like to hear him tell you that, <laughs> by the way. You specifically. Really. <laughs> yeah, I know, really. That, that's why I'm laughing. We are actually running out of time, unfortunately. I feel like we could sit here for another hour and have a, continue this conversation. I, I just want to make sure I thank you very much for joining and for, for writing this book and for talking about this issue in a, in 
a very fair way where we can address all of these different aspects of it so that people can can make a, an educated choice and decision and decide you know where where they feel with it and where they think you know they need to be with it so you have more questions you want to know more the ufo singularity micah hanks and you can find it now amazon.com barnes and noble anywhere else you want to buy it thank you so much for being here that's always my pleasure thank you hillary well, here we are, end of the show, guys. I uh, hope you join me next week. We are going to be talking about something very interesting. I'll be posting a bunch of new shows coming up through May. Guests will include William Henry, Hillary Carter, and uh, much, much more coming up next time. Thanks for being here. My prayers again go out to everybody in Boston and Texas. We are with you. Our thoughts are with you, and uh, you will overcome this. And for everybody whose family was affected or lost a loved one, um, our hearts are deeply, deeply deeply, deeply sending you love and prayers. Thank you, everybody. Good night.